Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on the future of the EU post-Brexit. My name is Janie Emerson, and I'm the Managing Director for the UK and Europe at Hanson Search. For those of you that don't know us, Hanson Search is a specialist headhunting business that focuses on communications, public affairs and marketing services. We're delighted to be joined today by a fantastic panel who we will introduce you to in just a moment. The session today will run for about an hour. We'll start with a discussion between our panel members and then we'll move to questions from our audience. You should all be able to see a Q&A button towards the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to, to pop any questions in there throughout the discussion. I'll keep an eye on it and hopefully we'll get through as many of those as we can towards the end. So I'll now pass over to our chair for today, my colleague, Barbara Osnan, who leads our European practice at Hanson Search. Thank you, Janie, and welcome everyone to this webinar. Today we will be discussing some important topics and changes that happen as a consequence of COVID from an EU perspective. This is a, an historic event and we talked a lot about what it meant for the UK. So we thought it'd be nice to have uh, to bring together industry experts to tackle this topic from an EU angle. So I'm very pleased today to welcome our fantastic speakers we having today uh, Andrew McCall, who is Vice President um, of Government Relations at Ford Motor Company. We also have Paul Maser, who is Senior Manager at BDI, the Federation of German Industries. And last but not least, uh, we're having Alan Habaker, who is Director of Public Affairs at CropLife Europe. So thank you for joining us, for joining this discussion today. And, um, you know, when thinking about the future of Europe, the pandemic comes as an immediate priority. So I would like to start the discussion with this today and, uh, you know, about what role does the EU play in the recovery from COVID? I would like to address this question to Paul. Paul, if you'd like to share with us some insight on what are the main challenges for the EU um, in the recovery from COVID. Thank you, Barbara. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here with you today. So um, let me give you just a brief, a brief overview of where we stand and what the issues are. Uh, clearly, number one challenge um, is uh, to get the vaccination program done as, um, as fast as possible. Uh, but that being said, um, we should also have a look at, at the economic consequences here. So um, one of the challenges um, that we had in Europe 10 years back, and that is actually coming back with COVID right now and with this uh, major shock we have we've saw over the last year is, is that uh, Europe is about to recover in a very heterogeneous way. So we're going to see that some countries will actually get out faster than others. I'm not saying which ones these will be because um, that all depends uh, on a broad variety of factors. Uh, and we saw that the, you know, for the countermeasures that were taken last year and that are still being taken over the next, uh, next years probably, uh, the financial firepower, the fiscal firepower in the government um, is, is quite, um, quite different uh, within the member states, uh, particularly in the Eurozone. So the idea was um, to have uh, a joint fund, um, so that is a lesson learned from 10 years back. Um, and uh, politically, it was quite surprising that we actually had a very broad agreement in a relatively short period of time, despite all the struggles um, that took place beforehand. Um, so, um, but the recovery this time, um, uh, since you were asking for it, uh, has to be quite different than the one that, that we've seen 10 years ago. Um, we live in a different world where climate change is a much more urgent factor than it was, um, unfortunately. Um, so uh, the investments cannot just go through the water can and we just fund whatever is there. Um, uh, it has to be a strategic approach. Um, that is certainly true. But the difficulties that we see right now is national governments are now supposed to present their plans uh, on how they conduct their investments. Um, and next to... Next to um, uh, climate change, anti-climate change actions, I should say, and um, digitization issues, uh, the governments must act at, at a very rapid pace. And, and that remains, remains the number one challenge. So the plans are, are being made, but definitely, uh, basically we need to spend the money now, which means uh, over the next six to nine months in a very, very fast pace. Uh, and that uh, 
proves to be troublesome uh, in some member states. Um, uh, that being said, um, uh, I think um, the outlook is not too bad. Um, we have now about 750 billion um, euros which, which are being put on the table, partly through the EU budget, partly through a separate um, uh, uh, financial facility. Uh, so uh, we all hope that the recovery through that stimulus will uh, will kick in shortly, um, and that it will make, go into into a more um, yeah strategic uh, direction uh, in line with the overall policy. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. And um, building on Paul's view, um, Alan, could you maybe tell us more about? The engagement changes that it meant and maybe um, how can we use um, the COVID situation to shift to um, more sustainability and value-driven societies and economies? Yeah, great. Thank you, Barbara, and um, good morning, everybody. Um, so, yes, I think probably everybody who's working in public affairs and communications has had, uh, quite simply, one hell of a year. The last year has probably been one of the biggest challenges of your uh, professional life uh, for, for many different reasons. And I think I, I, in answering your question, Barbara, I'd like to focus on, on three different areas of, of change and challenge. Um, so uh, I think the first area that we've probably all experienced in the last 12 months is the completely uncertain volatile and fast-paced environment that we work in. Now, as, as public affairs and communications professionals, I think we probably all thought that we knew what it was to work in a volatile and fast-paced environment until the last 12 months came along. And we discovered that it could be actually even more volatile and even more fast-paced than it was um, before. So <clears throat> I, I imagine this has meant different things for different people, depending on what businesses or what sectors you work for. This has um, been anything from your supply chain just getting cut um, for products not coming in, customers not being able to access your product or service. You, you've probably had to think about things that you never had to think about before that suddenly were absolutely business critical. Whereas before you were somewhere around the edges of your business, shaping, looking at the future, doing the old bit of firefighting, suddenly you were business critical because if that supply chain didn't open, if that customer base wasn't accessible, your business suddenly just wasn't making any money. So you've, you've probably been thrust into a centrality that, that maybe you didn't have before. Now, um, clearly that was probably quite stressful, but it's also a, a, a huge opportunity for a public affairs function and communications function. Maybe we'll touch on that later in the discussion. So I think after 12 months, I, I hate to say it, it's, 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 it has somewhat normalized this, this volatility and uncertainty. And, and I think, you know, that has likely meant that people have had to come up with, with new processes, uh, new internal ways of working. Um, they probably had to look for new stakeholders, potentially new consultants to access gaps that they have identified that, that they couldn't manage um, in, in the interim period. So I think there's probably been quite a healthy uh, reflection about how you do your public affairs and communications work, but it's probably much more than you would have normally had. You've been forced into a circumstance where you needed to really review what is it we do and how do we do it and how can we respond to this situation? Now, if I, if I zoom in a little bit then uh, to a second point, so the first is this uncertainty and, and volatility. And maybe actually maybe just one final point on that, and just picking up a little bit on what Paul said, is th there's obviously then a, a, a political volatility in the EU. So this is, this, the, this is happening at a time when you have, um, obviously you have Brexit, um, you have just literally, I think, last week, the kickoff of the future of the EU discussions, the future of Europe. Where's this whole project going? Um, you know, Paul mentioned vaccine. I think he's mentioning it from a very practical perspective. There is obviously now the vaccine diplomacy, vaccine politics, which means that the politics within the EU is 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 very unstable. Alliances that you took for granted can can shift overnight just because somebody had more vaccine than somebody else. So it's it's creating quite a, a, a different environment for us to, to work in. And then that leads to a second area that I think is important to touch on, which is how we communicate and engage in the EU in this, in this particular time. Um, and, and quite simply, this has just been this massive, oh, this massive flight to online. Um, how, how, do we, how do we try to do everything we did before and, and, and do it online? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, like, uh, like myself, many of you now are the proud owners of accounts with Zoom, WebEx, Teams, Skype, Slack. Um, 
probably like me struggle to uh, through the course of the day see what messages you've got on what channels and respond to any of them um, <clears throat> Uh, hopefully, like me, you're managing to now rationalise a little bit of this way of communicating into something that is less chaotic uh, and makes a little bit more sense to you. Um, and, and I think then when you go into the external space, clearly engagement and communications have continued. I mean, it's just it, it, it never stopped. It couldn't stop. In fact, the necessity was, was, was never greater. We're just doing it in a different way. We've all adapted. Um, and through this, we've lost certain things. We've lost the whole world of nonverbal communication. We've lost that ability to read a situation. We've really lost the ability to have good multi-person in-depth discussions. You know, there are some things that you just can't replicate online. You know, the, the old days of a, of, a, of a flip chart and a board and five or six people in a room trying to get into something just doesn't replicate into an online space. So there are certain things that, 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 that we've lost. We've lost serendipitous moments at conferences or chance meetings in corridors. Um, we, we've lost that informal element of, of, um, of communicating, ways that we used to work. At the same time, however, I think many of us have probably recognized that we've also gained many things. We've, we've gained access to more stakeholders around the world than we probably would have ever otherwise had access to. Um, we've also probably and this sounds probably perverse, many of you would push back on this, we've probably also gained time. Um, a 30 minute meeting now takes 30 minutes. <clears throat> you don't have to go to the parliament, get a pass, get in, sit and wait for 45 minutes while the, the person is able to see you. So your 30 minute meeting that used to take four hours now takes 30 minutes. So it gives you an ability to, to, to reach more, more people. And finally, the last point there is, it gives you the ability, I think, to have the right people in the right meetings. You maybe wouldn't have flown a technical expert halfway around the world for a 30 minute meeting. It just didn't seem worth it. Whereas now you can have them in the same Zoom call. So you can get some of that input. So I think that the key here is obviously is going to be the balance we strike going forward. How do we take the best of what we've learnt, mix it with the best of what we used to have and, and, and come up with a hybrid? And I think as we as, as, as countries hopefully move to exit, that's what's going to happen. And then, and then lastly, Barbara, I'll touch on your question of of sustainability, um, which I think is 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 clearly a, a, a theme that all of us in, in public affairs and communications have to face right now. Um, and I think in the EU, this is this is European Commission prime time. This is this is the time when they come up with their legislative agenda, they throw it all out there, and then the machine gets going. And clearly, at the heart of all of this is sustainability. So what you see at the moment is a societal drive. Um, and a legislative drive to to push sustainability, as, as I think Paul mentioned, you know, with a need for us to do this. <clears throat> and I think if you couple that with this fast moving, uncertain uh, external environment that, that has been driven by COVID and the circumstances we find us in, I think that actually doubles down on the opportunity for us to, to drive change. And I think actually, it, Maybe, maybe those of you who've been working in Brussels for, for a number of time would <clears throat> remember the days when you know, a jobs argument was sufficient to push something forward. Um, I think trade and economy arguments are no longer the trump cards you need. You systematically, you systematically get a response of, you know, no, 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 but what does, what does that, what's your contribution to sustainability? What, what, what does that mean for the Green Deal? You know, I'm, I'm really interested in your factory, but tell me about, about this. So it's, this is this is a reality that we face, and I think the challenge, actually, from a sustainability perspective, is, is unfortunately something that we have to shoulder, as we are confronted with this sustainability question every day of our professional lives. The challenge is not there in the outside world. The challenge is probably in our companies. The challenge is is how do we effectively translate this external environment into something that our companies want to move forward with in a non-rhetorical way. Uh, so, i.e. a meaningful way uh, and getting them to understand the, the direction of travel. And I think that's, a, that's an external environment that, that, that we face that we need to somehow work back into our companies. But maybe we can touch on that a little bit later, Barbara, and I'll, I'll hold there for now. Okay, thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Um, yes, a lot of changes uh, for sure. And when we Think about Brexit, I mean, uh, one of the major impacts is obviously the trade relations as well. So um, I would like to hand over now to Andrew. Andrew, if you could tell us a bit more about what it means in terms of how, you know, the trade relations are now redistributed and what are the impacts that Brexit has on them within the EU. 
Thank you, Barbara, and uh, and th thank you for the invitation and uh, looking forward to the discussion today. And uh, I must say a lot of what Alan just said is highly resonant with me and, uh, you know, about how we're having to, um, how we've had to adapt to the way we work. And so I think that that's an interesting thread of discussion uh, you know, for this for this meeting. Um, uh, you know, and a, a great example of that volatility and that business critical impact is, is on trade relations and, of course, uh, you know, the, the centerpiece of that was, was Brexit. And, um, and I wanted to just talk a little bit about, well, where do we stand on, on trade um, in the UK and the EU uh, now that the uh, Brexit uh, deal is done? I mean, I, I think I, I start from the premise that expanding trade opportunities can play a pretty important part in supporting the economic recovery. Uh, so, although I agree with Alan that, uh, you know, trade is not the necessarily the trump card, um, it's clearly going to be very important. So I don't think this is an academic debate. It, it's, it's critical that we move forward on trade. Uh, I mean, if you look at uh, the UK-EU deal, <clears throat> I mean, I think the first thing to say is that it's positive that it was done. <clears throat> and I appreciate that probably looks different from different sectors. Um, but, you know, from the auto sector perspective, um, it was pretty much night and day uh, in terms of potential outcomes as we approached Christmas and, you know, having a tariff-free agreement um, was extremely material for, for our sector. Um, so I think that that was positive. Now, of course, it's bedding down and, uh, you know, there have been some issues. Um, I, from our perspective, um, those are, are, are not too material, although I know, again, you know, for other sectors, uh, they are more significant. Um, but I think if we accept that, you know, that's been done, uh, you know, where do we now stand? I would just want to make one other point about the UK-EU deal. I think it was done actually with a nod towards future technologies and future deals because a critical part of the deal was, uh, especially in autos, was around rules of origin for batteries, cells and components for electric vehicles. And, you know, back to Alan's point about sustainability, that and the, the primacy of the Green Deal, uh, actually the drive towards electrification actually manifested itself within this agreement. And I think we'll do so in future agreements, uh, which I think is kind of an interesting change um, uh, from, from where we were. But if, if the, the TCA kind of provides a platform, where do we now go from here? I mean, clearly we need stability in that deal. And, uh, and I think both the UK and the EU recognise that. Uh, and assuming that does remain stable, then I think that both the UK and the EU, EU actually have opportunities, you know, to seize opportunities in, in, in the trade area. Uh, and, you know, the EU has published its, its uh, you know, trade strategy and there's clearly ambition there to, to agree further deals. I, I think, you know, others will talk more about this, but I mean, I think the great advantage the EU has is its scale here um, as, as such a significant market. But perhaps one of the weaknesses is that the process of agreeing and ratifying trade deals uh, can be just quite labored, It'll take a long time to agree deals. So, so I think there's a real case for injecting some urgency uh, in the EU to agree deals. You know, there are some that are on the stocks, Mercosur, Mexico, and of course there's the investment agreement with China. I think that's acting with urgency to ensure that trade does really make a contribution to the COVID recovery, alongside the spending of the recovery funds that, uh, that, uh, that Alan talked about, uh, is, is going to be very important. I think from the UK perspective, interestingly, um, I mean, it doesn't have the EU scale clearly, and therefore the same weight in, in negotiations, but, but against that probably has more opportunity to move quickly. Um, and the UK, as we know, has also published its trade priorities, Australia, New Zealand, US. I don't actually see the US uh, agreement happening in the short term, especially with, uh, you know, some of the uh, incoming priorities of the Biden administration. But uh, and then there's the question of joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, which is, you know, again, not something that's been tried before. So. You know, the UK, I think, is finding itself in this position where, you know, it's, it's got to consider its bandwidth and its priority, uh, prioritisation as it kind of goes through these numerous negotiations. Well, I think from a public affairs perspective, it's interesting because we now have, 
Whereas before you had an EU trade agenda, now you have a UK trade agenda and an EU trade agenda. Uh, and so you have two separate but linked uh, trade, trade uh, um, uh, agendas to follow. Uh, and I think if you have a footprint in the UK and the EU that's trade dependent, then, you know, how you decide to engage and deploy resources, uh, you know, is clearly a, a challenge for you. Um, perhaps just a couple of final comments. I mean, uh, uh, you know, building on this sustainability point, I, I think, you know, increasingly we're seeing trade policy linked to other policy and regulatory goals. And it's always been the case to a certain extent, but I think especially now, I mean, when you look at how the EU is emerging from, uh, from COVID, you know, the Green Deal and the digital agenda are absolutely reinforced as priorities. And the EU is not going to pursue any deals, trade deals that run counter to those objectives. And I think there's broad alignment actually with the UK on some of this, you know, especially on climate uh, goals. Um, uh, but, you know, when I, when I think perhaps as a final point that, <clears throat> you know, regulatory divergence was the other uh, one of the other key points in the negotiations between the UK and the EU. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the agreement, of course, does pose some limits, impose some limits upon that. And depending upon your standpoint, that's either a risk or an opportunity. I say for the automotive sector, it's more of a risk because uh, there's no uh, benefit in regulatory divergence because we're you know, selling in the, uh, the EU market uh, on environmental issues and so on. Uh, but um, I think, as, as was just said, this is an incredibly active regulatory period for the EU. And as we look forward, uh, that could provide a potential source of friction as new regulations come on board. So I think that's worth keeping a close eye on as well. So those are just a few thoughts, uh, Barbara, and uh, you know, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Andrew. It's very interesting. And thank you for the insight about you know, how, how trades are now um, affected within the EU. And that actually leads to our next topic, because if we take a step back on how the EU can now position it itself on the global, uh, global scene, um, I would like maybe to come back to Paul on this one. And Paul, if you can tell us a bit more on how um, Europe you know, can now form alliances on the global, global scene, global markets. Yeah, thank you. I think um, uh, Andrew touched upon uh, some very, very important points um, that we have a new player in the game, which is the United Kingdom, but that also alters um, the EU strategy. Uh, we must not forget that over the past years, um, the, the Union was quite busy on its agenda with dealing with Brexit. And uh, while not everything has been sorted out yet, um, now it's, there is some, some space freed up on the agenda. And, um, what it seems to me what's going to come more and more into focus is the issue of European sovereignty. Sometimes it's called open strategic economy. There are various terms for it. Um, and that is going to be at the center for, Euro uh, for, for the European Union, which is clearly um, a move uh, towards how we will deal with China uh, as the main uh, challenge in international trade. Um, certainly that, that factor has accelerated with uh, the lack of masks and vaccines and, and uh, uh, several other components as, such as chips. Uh, and I think what we are going to see is, is Europe is going to, to look for new alliances um, to uh, maybe not to become, uh, to create an autarky, but to, to um, manage its, its dependencies to other, to other regions. Uh, and that is quite, quite interesting with the new Biden administration, because we might see um, um, a, a renaissance of a transatlantic partnership. Um, uh, and we're going to see, um, and we, we, we will have to wait and see what the Biden administration is actually planning to do on China, for instance, and uh, on um, uh, on a foreign policy from a foreign policy perspective, also on Russia, certainly. Um, but what, what's going to happen is, and we see this as we speak, that China is going to open its markets for some countries, um, uh, for as many countries as possible, and uh, we have to make them an offer. And I think the Europeans can do it, and the Americans can do it. But again, we only have so many resources, also the public affairs field, so that we probably um, are good in sharing the burden. There are certain goals that we share, also with the United Kingdom, whether it comes to um, human rights as 
the United Kingdom is currently experiencing and it's with its interests in Hong Kong. Um, we have environmental issues, um, touched upon them already, labor standards, social norms, et cetera, et cetera. All of this is something where we want to shape the world rather after our values and not after China's. And, and, and the reason why I'm saying this, why I'm touching upon all of this is for two reasons. First of all, for us in the public affairs, Feel that means we need to prepare ourselves for these debates. Uh, Alan touched upon the societal drive uh, that we see uh, all across Europe. So we have to answer these questions when we come forward with a strategy and ask legislators, for instance, um, uh, for a way forward, which, forward which we think is is sensible. Uh, and the other reason is, um, uh, and we have the United Kingdom um, again, a new player in the field. Um, uh, we actually made, uh, made, I think, some good work on the TCA. Um, while it's not being perfect, I think it brought us um, closer to some point. But uh, I guess for the Europeans, it's, it's very critical to figure out where the UK is heading, which economic model um, it, is, uh, it is engaging on, will be engaging on, uh, and which foreign uh, and, and uh, trade policy it will pursue. And then we have to see where the overlaps are, but that also requires some research. So what can we do in the public affairs field? I think we need to acquire more expertise. Uh, I think um, it won't be sufficient just to focus on one field. So if you say you deal with UK EU relations, that's good, but you will probably have to look at it from a more global perspective going forward. And um, uh, you can't just tackle climate policy on its own. When you look at uh, what the European Union has gone through with Mercosur, that's actually, I think, a great example. Um, there were some standards um, on uh, protecting the rainforest uh, in the agreement. It was not sufficient for, for um, some governments uh, in the union, but I think it is important uh, to understand also for those who work in the environmental field. Um, that uh, trade policy can serve as a lever, but only to such an extent. You can't, uh, you can't coerce other countries into certain policies. So uh, that broader understanding, that general understanding is something we have to work towards. Um, I personally all made always good experiences with working in teams uh, and getting in touch with people who are experts in, in the other fields. So we have to uh, certainly widen our own horizons in, in the weeks and months to come. Thank you. I give it back with that. And looking forward to the, to the discussion as well. Thank you, Paul. Um, very interesting. And, um, you know, we, we've been speaking about all the changes and all the challenges from the Brexit, from, from, uh, from COVID, from uh, trade relations, from politics. And uh, you all started to, to, to mention the topic of how does what, what, what does that mean in, for the approach to government relations and, and public affairs? And I can see a few questions from uh, the audience also uh, on this topic. So let's get into it. Um, Alan, if you want to start about, with this, what, what are your thoughts on, on how this is changing uh, the approach to public affairs and lobbying? Yeah, no, sure. And I'll, I'll try and I've been also monitoring the chat and the questions. I think I can maybe give some sort of first responses to, to Marco and Mark with a couple of their comments. So, um, yeah, I, as I said earlier, I think uh, and I think as Andrew echoed and Paul probably also, it, there's been a lot of rethinking in, in how we do public affairs and community. It's been it's been contingent on us to think about what we do and how we do it. I suspect that certain things have come out of everybody's thinking, certain commonalities. And I think one of them and that that sort of touches on. The, the question that Mark made, um, and to some extent touches on the comment that Marco made in the chat. So Mark, Mark asked about you know the contacts, and it's key to keep in touch with people to understand the dynamics. And, uh, and Marco talked about the accelerated EU decision making process, where they're just they're, they're, they're running a steamrollering ahead faster than ever before. And I think the first thing that we learned out of this, or that I learned, was that we needed to have much better information flows. We needed to have much better information management. So that meant uh, earlier I alluded to maybe having new consultants. The first thing we did is we've had to find new uh, monitoring platforms that give us information. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we realized that before in a, in a, in a normal environment, we were monitoring very much the regulatory developments. We've realized that we also now need to go up a few levels and monitor the political developments. Whereas in the past, we, we didn't tend to have the macro analysis in, in our public affairs teams that kind of sat somewhere with risk or strategy or corporate developments. We've discovered that, that we need to, 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 to bridge these two gaps. And then the third thing is, 
from an information management perspective, like many of you, you're probably doing this by what I'm going to call the scrape system. So just, you know, alerts that come to you from different providers. Whereas we've discovered that in this volatile environment, the human connection is, is even more important than it ever was to get the right information at the right time. So I think I can't stress that space enough that we've had that the thinking that we've had to do about the information we get and how we do that better. So I think that's something that, that really is uh, is quite important. Um, I think, and this then touches to to something that, that both Paul and, uh, and Andrew have said, is the, the upskilling. We've discovered that the skills that we didn't have in our teams, in our public affairs teams, um, and, and that, that were lacking, obviously obvious ones relate to perhaps social media, but actually as, as a more dedicated public affairs skill set, sustainability, um, this, this, the, the ability to be tapped into the sustainability debate and translate the needs of our business or our clients into uh, sustainability speak, if you like, um, was a skill that we didn't have. And then the obvious, the other one that, that both Paul and Andrew just been talking about is trade. Um, never had so many trade items on our desk. And, you know, just even going back to the basics, what's the process of approving an FTA in the EU? Just really back to basics. It's never really been a massive part of the work that we do. So I, I think if you cover those, I think then another piece that's very important has been I imagine we've all had to make some tough choices, uh, tough choices because the, the scope of the issues that we're covering has probably broadened. Uh, the pace of them has accelerated and it therefore makes it quite difficult for you to keep on top of everything. And I think um, that 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 has certainly been a big challenge. This this what I'm going to call a conversation of prioritization within a business. Um, you know, we can't follow all 57 things that seem to be happening right now with any level of, of depth. What is it we need to focus on? So that that has been it's probably been a good but challenging discussion. And maybe I just want to end this before I before I hand back to you, Barbara, to say that you know if, if ever there was a time where public affairs and communications was was needed to to, to manage an external environment and give 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 sort of and, and show and demonstrate value to a business, yeah, I mean it absolutely has been the last twelve months and it it continues to be so now. And you know I, I hope. Like uh, like myself, I hope many 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 people on this webinar have found the last year, you know, when you haven't had a 12, 12 hours of back to back Zoom meetings, that that you find that this has been one of the most professionally challenging and developmental times. So it's it's, it's a very exciting time, and even now, all of these changes in the external environment and how we work, you know, you rarely have the two coupled together. So yes, lots of exciting things. I'm trying to end on a big positive thing. Maybe Barbara, maybe I could add just a couple of comments there to, to what Alan said. Um, I mean, sort of agree with so much of that. Um, I mean, I think this point around volatility has actually been with us now for the last year or two. COVID has added a much, another layer to that. We now have another issue, which is the shortage of semiconductor uh, chips, uh, which is impacting production here. But you have one business critical issue after another. Uh, and uh, I think to your point, you know, I can I can remember kind of uh, you know worrying ten years ago about the reach directive or something sitting in Brussels, and you know how, how in six months' time that was going to get approved, and uh, it's not like that anymore, right? These are business critical uh, issues, and you need to manage how you're going to you know work on those. I mean, and I think on the volatility point, I think one of the things we've all had to learn is how to manage that political volatility. You know and how that's perceived in your company or your organization uh, because you know if you're just reacting to every headline you're just going to get panic all of the time and uh you know you have to accept it's a kind of a roller coaster um and and there will be ups and downs just as there were on the brexit discussion but try to keep uh, a kind of a base assessment on where you think things stand and not react to every headline i think that was the first thing i was going to say second thing is that uh, certainly acquiring new areas of expertise is so crucial. I mean, we've had to, to uh, really try to understand things like rules of origin, you know, what makes up the percentage of local content. It's so critical uh, to these trade agreements. You know, it's the difference between paying a, a significant tariff or not. Uh, and especially now when one looks forward, I'm sure this is going to be the case with other sectors too, uh, you know, we're looking at electric vehicles, batteries, cells, and so on. where does it all come from? How does it all come together in terms of local content? Uh, but there will be other industries who I, I think are, who are having to, to, to look at that in a similar way. And so you do need new expertise and you need 
uh, to bring in uh, you know people to help you with that. And I guess the final the final point. Uh, I mean, we've talked a lot about you know online working and so on. And I agree, actually, to some extent. You know, meeting is a meeting then uh, with a minister or whoever. You know, you have your thirty minutes and you don't have any of the messing about going in and out of buildings and so on. Uh, however, I, I, I still feel you miss quite a lot from the, the, the interaction. Uh, and so personally, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, getting back to that, not losing everything that we've gained and uh, some of the advantages and efficiencies we've gained from online working. But I think it's going to be some kind of hybrid uh, going forward um, and, and looking forward to that. And, and perhaps, sorry, just uh, I'll stop talking, but you know, my final thought is that you know, as teams, we're, I think we're having to change the way we work. Much quicker, much more agile. Uh, it's less now about, I think, we, I certainly find about reporting on issues, you know, reporting on status. It's more about working the problem and working the issue. Uh, and, and certainly with, you know, with my team, that's what you know, I try to spend as much time doing as possible. Because if you're reporting the various political developments you'll spend your entire time doing that rather than actually working on the issues but thanks thank you yeah. Andrew. maybe yeah paul if you have anything yeah to if, if i may just uh, thank you i would just follow up on what andrew just said because i think he was making quite quite an important uh point when COVID kicked in and with this our new mode of working um, we were at a point where structures were quite established. So I think we all knew who the people where we were regularly talking to. Uh, they knew us, we knew them. Um, and uh, there was a thing which is cannot be valued enough and which is trust uh, among people. So um, you could easily switch on an online platform. I mean, we were using phones in, in the back in the days and that worked as well. Um, but what I noticed over the time is uh, whenever we had the staff changes, whether it was on our side or on the other side, uh, then all of a sudden we had a new person and we needed to onboard them. Uh, and that proved to be quite, quite a hefty challenge because sometimes that person is totally new to, let's say, public affairs even, uh, or the field or the team and all of this. Um, it's extremely hard when you, when you um, lack that personal interaction. So uh, if, I, if I sum it up you know, from the first round that we had, I think uh, what we need is A, expertise in many more fields than, than we needed before. We need integrity. I mean, that goes without saying. Uh, and then we need trust. And uh, you know, when we form new relationships online, as my personal experience here, uh, I think you know, like time is limited. I think how do I use it? Uh, what is, um, how do I use that resource? Uh, and I figure that, you know, it takes, it takes longer than without personal meetings. So you need to invest more. You need to talk more to people. Uh, maybe not uh, in longer talks because uh, let's face it, um, 12 hour Zoom meetings can be quite, um, quite exhausting, but uh, having short meetings uh, uh, at a higher frequency has proven to be, uh, in my case, has proven to be more effective uh, in terms of uh, networking and, uh, you know, and getting to that point, which Alan said, uh, pointed out in the very beginning to have a platform for new information. Um, uh, and that only goes through, through human interaction. Thank you, Paul. Um, if we talk, I know you, some of, of you already touched on that, that uh, topic. Um, if we talk about how companies really have to adapt their, um, their public affairs function and the structure and their agenda, um, maybe Alan, if you, if you have any thoughts on, on this. Yeah, I, I have a few thoughts and then I have a question for Andrew actually. So, um, um, so it, yes, I think clearly that over the last year, every public affairs function in the company has had to have been asking itself some pretty hard questions about what it does, how it does it, but then also it's, its relationship to its own business um, in, in terms of, and I think this, is, this, is, this has been something that's a big opportunity. It's been a huge challenge, it's a big opportunity. This is the question I'm gonna to put to Andrew is, you gave a good example in the past, breach, okay? A huge, monstrous, big, normal, standard, old fashioned Brussels file takes years to go through, has big implementation timelines. Um, it's one of those things that it's very difficult to engage a business on because it kind of never seems to be having an impact until it has an impact. Uh, and that was kind of what I would call the classical challenge of a public affairs function is trying to get your business engaged in something that isn't hitting them in the face. 
Whereas today, uh, you know, we talk about the speed and the criticality of the issues that happen. They they allow they they force a public affairs and communications function into 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 demonstrating value that is immediate and tangible. Whereas in the past, they're two of the things that I think public affairs and communications functions have often struggled to demonstrate. What was the commercial value? And and you know how could we uh, 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 attach to that? And I'm just I, I'm just wondering. So there's, there's part of a response in there, Barbara. But I'm just wondering, um, Andrew, is that is that is there is there a change of perception in your company as you've had to deal with these sort of critical issues? Is that is that changing something in the way that you do public affairs? I think it's a good point, Alan. I, I mean, and I, and I think you know, and it's probably the case for most businesses. It's a sort of a risk opportunity discussion. And, you know, when you look at it, 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 you're simply looking at, well, what's the scale of the, you know, the potential impact? And that in itself drives the priority. That's the driver of the priority, you know, and that's why the, the Brexit issue is such a significant one for us and for other automotive companies, because, you know, the imposition of a tariff would have just had such an immediate material financial impact. Uh, and, you know, and that's really how we assess, you know, most of these, uh, these regulations. And, uh, and I think that's why, you know, it has captured much more attention within our businesses. So then the, then the issue is, well, you know, how do you manage that and how do you, um, how do you report on that? And how do you, how do you show what you're doing, <laughs> uh, frankly, to influence that? And sometimes these things are difficult to influence, right? I, I mentioned the, you know, some of the trade issues, you know, and uh, the, the long ratification process that exists and we know there are multiple influences upon that just as there are on other you know, pieces of legislation that we're going to see in relation to the green deal and so on uh, and uh, you know sometimes one has to accept that there are other uh, um, stakeholders here as well who are going to you know who are going to play a part uh, and so to make sure that the, the you know the, that your company uh, understands that properly so yeah I mean it's you know it's clear to me that there's been a change uh, you know, in the last two to three years, you know, both in terms of that volatility we talked about and in terms of the business critical nature um, of, of what happens in Brussels and how critical that is. Uh, and I do think that is recognised uh, in our business in answer to your question. I've also noticed actually a question from Mark, I think, on the, on the line to say, has there been a change in access um, to EU institutions uh, post-Brexit uh, uh, and I can certainly say, you know, from my own point of view, there's been no change to that. I, I have a European role at the moment. I just happen to be in the UK, but uh, I certainly haven't noticed any change along that, uh, along those lines. Thanks for the question, Alan. Mark. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Paul, I wonder, is there anything you want to add on, uh, on uh, Andrew's and Alan, uh, what you just said? And uh, maybe we can move to, um, to the, like open the questions to the audience. Sure. Um, I think Alan is, is touching on, uh, on quite an important point because uh, what has not just changed is how we act in the political sphere. Um, we also see changes how, how decision making takes place within our businesses. And we see that actually in the business association quite, quite intensely. Um, it was uh, in the good old days, uh, whenever they might have been, um, there was uh, there were business uh, business leaders and they made business decisions um, and the awareness for p uh, public affairs in general was much lower than it is today because the attention for business leaders in particular and think about the CEOs not just the C suites uh, think of the CEOs themselves they uh, eventually have to answer questions which they haven't heard before in annual meetings uh, and that is not just in in the big corporates not just in the Fortune 500s you will see that also in, in SME. So what we see is, is that the desire for information, the, the requests for information, um, they're increasing um, uh, on a broad scale. And, and Brexit certainly was, uh, was also an accelerator for this. So we saw that, that the desire within businesses to talk about political affairs uh, and to get briefed about the background, has, backgrounds has become much, much, um, much stronger than before. So, what we do as public affairs professionals plays much more role in, in, in strategy making within businesses than it did before, uh, because businesses are under much more scrutiny um, through the public um, 
and you can you can basically just Google everything. You get reviews. You, you get sometimes uh, leaked information, and all that is something that that affects our work directly. Thank you, Paul. Should we move on to the question from the audience, Jane? Yes. Yeah, definitely. We've had lots coming through and, and feel free to, to add any more in as we're talking. So I'll try and get through as many of them as we can. Um, so one that's come through from Marcus, how do you see the following impacting the post-Brexit relationship? The uncertainty of the UK-US trade deal, which I know you, you sort of some of you've talked about already, but also the Scottish independence movement and Northern Ireland. I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and take that one first. Maybe I'll have a go, shall I then? Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> uh, um, so in terms of, um, I mean, I, I think in terms of you, you, the US is an interesting one because, you know, clearly that's a priority for the UK. Um, I think, uh, you know, with the incoming Biden administration, their first priority is COVID and economic recovery. And so I think trade deals are going to be a little bit further down the line. Um, uh, but in terms of it, I, I don't necessarily see it as a destabilizing fact. I think that can, as I mentioned before, I think, you know, we have the UK EU agreement. I think, um, you know, obviously subject to the terms of the UK US agreement, but I, I don't think, I think it should, should add rather than, uh, you know, uh, be anything that's a, a threat or considered a threat or a risk. Um, on, on, uh, yeah, on Scotland, uh, <laughs> Probably shouldn't, as a British, probably shouldn't delve too too deeply into that. I mean, the question was about, uh, you know, how, how we see it. I mean, I think the, uh, we're probably some way away from another referendum. Um, I guess we've got the Scottish elections coming up and, you know, we'll see how that, how that uh, you know, drives the next steps. But, yeah, that's probably all I would, uh, I would say on that. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so another question is coming from Liz. Any thoughts on how to solve the um, bureaucracy that's now afflicting imports and exports between the UK and the EU? Alan or Paul, any, any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I'm happy, happy to take that one. It's, um, I think we have to get used to the fact that there will be bureaucracy much more than we had before. Um, I think that is uh, clear to everyone, even whether you were on the Brexiteer or Remain side. Um, I think uh, uh, that is part of the nature when you disentangle two markets. But uh, what is now the challenge is, is to make that practical. And um, we see that investments uh, is necessary, public and private, here and there. Um, and uh, what, from what we saw in the first quarter is, is that indeed many businesses, small businesses, um, particularly in the United Kingdom, were not as prepared as, um, as they wanted to. This is not because uh, of any incapabilities. It's just that the challenge for UK businesses was, was much, much bigger than for businesses on our side. Um, for us, it was just a part of the market where we needed to adjust processes, um, where the ability was there to f seek alternatives. Um, these were opportunities which, which um, the UK economy didn't have to the same extent that we had. Um, it will be sold over time, that is true, um, but I think um, it would be better um, for both sides to do that as quickly as possible because um, all these delays that we're seeing, and they're still there even though we don't have uh, a lot of uh, traffic jams at the border, um, uh, trucks are still not departing to the extent that they did pr um, prior, prior to Brexit. Mm. It hurt. It hurts both of us on uh, on the global scale, and um, uh, I think I think um, the other two panelists probably have similar experiences than than uh, what we hear from our from our businesses. Great, thank you, Paul. And so, next question, I'll come to you, Alan, if that's okay. Um, from Mark, to what extent are digital policy skills useful to have? So, for example, the AI regulations, the Digital Services Act, and the Digital Markets Act. I don't know what your thoughts are there. Yeah, I think the the, the uh, I think they're slightly slightly decoupled. I mean, this is policy sector specific regulation mm -hmm. that the, the the EU has to look at, um, and yes, it has some. Uh, like we said, this is Commission prime time, so this is the time to lay down all of the ambitions. Um, and you know, especially with the Digital Services Act, it's 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 laying down its marker for what it wants to achieve. Um, 
That one, of course, is 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 like many of the other flagships that the European Commission has laid down at the moment. None of these things exist in isolation. So its own Green Deal sustainability ambitions will create barriers or opportunities to trade with the rest of the world, depending on what they are. In the same way, this digital uh, space is also going to to either create fortress Europe or open Europe. So it's going to create different standards. So there's, I think a lot of what you see in these areas is global tension or tension with a lot of the trading partners of the EU with respect to these different policy areas. And I think in the digital space, you know, the biggest area of tension is likely going to be with the US uh, f- from where many of these big providers come. So I think, yes, there's, there's the whole big digital space that is is shaping up for what does Europe want to do in this space and how is that going to fit with what uh, many of its big trade partners do. As separate, Jamie, from a whole discussion about, you know, social media, public affairs skills, which I think is, is perhaps something separate. Great, thank you. And then a question from uh, Nabil, who is studying an executive MBA and is part of that sustainability. Um, How does public affairs have a real impact on sustainability and environmental issues? And and can you give any examples either in in your businesses or or in businesses you've seen as to how public affairs has has impacted that in in real life? I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer on that one. I think it's a great question for all of us, if you ask me. Um, But Nabil, the the bad news first, Rome wasn't built in a day. So uh, the impact that you were asking for will certainly take some time. But to give you one concrete example that you were asking for, when I started my job on uh, and, and tried to, to um, manage uh, the German business interests on Brexit, uh, there was a lot of mistrust that I actually encountered uh, among my European counterparts, which was simply because uh, there were lots of rumors out there. The strategy was not laid out yet, neither politically nor on on the lobbying side. Uh, But what did happen is, what was an experience that I made is your face makes the difference. Um, uh, Once you show up, once you you talk to people and you explain to them what you have in mind and what your plan is, um, then um, uh, if you have a strong case to make, uh, people might follow suit. So you eventually have an impact on on policymakers. and, uh, you know, there was a lot of mistrust whether the German government will eventually um, leave the compromise that was found in, um, uh, in the European context. And uh, the challenge was also to, to uh, display how the, the domestic debate here actually plays out. And that had an, indeed an international impact. And, you know, what I heard back from also our government reps was uh, it helps that, that, that you are talking to other people across the continent about what your interests are, because that shows them uh, why we as a government are where we are. And um, uh, it won't go from the very beginning. Um, uh, you've got to be patient, but um, here's the other side that's going to be the case in whatever profession you want to choose. Uh, yeah, again, uh, Rome wasn't built in the day. Maybe, uh, Jamie, could I uh, just add a comment there? I think, sure. I think it's, it's com- absolutely fundamental, um, the, you know, the type of you know, the role that, uh, you know, that people in our profession you know, have played when it comes to you know, sustainability. And you know, I think the view we've taken in, in our sector is that in order to realise the aims of the Green Deal, you need a partnership with the regulator and with industry and actually with other uh, stakeholders as well, you know, in order to make sure that you know, all of the uh, objectives of the Green Deal uh, are, are achieved and that we maintain, you know, economic strength in sectors like the automotive industry, the research and development, that we have the skills needed as those skills transform uh, over the, the coming years. And, you know, people in our line of work play a really important part, I think, in shaping that whole debate. Uh, so, Nabil, yes, absolutely, uh, and, and I certainly believe that to be the case. Great, thank you, Andrew. So I think probably final question, and I'll come to you first on this one, Alan, if that's okay. Um, the EU and UK agreement establishes certain mechanisms to make sure the UK policy does not stray too far from the EU's in certain areas, such as the environment. Um, how do you think this will play out in practice? Do you think that the UK will successfully use mechanisms to influence the direction of EU policy, or do you think it will always be the other way around? 
Um, so I, I think I think this is, is is almost as if the UK were in the EU on this one. The, the, I think the UK was a very effective lobbying machine from a government perspective and the companies. It's probably one of the most professional government private sector lobbying machines in Brussels. That didn't go away overnight. Uh, they might have left, uh, you know, the, the UK rep might have become UK miss, but it's still the same people operating in a city they know well. So I, I imagine that the UK will be very active at trying to shape uh, the future of European regulation in the same way that I expect the EU to try and be active in shaping what happens in the UK. I, I think this is going to be just a, a, a continual dance and balance that sometimes is going to go a bit wrong and, and sometimes they're going to get it right. But I, I, I actually think that Brexit will make the UK lobbying in the EU more effective in some ways than it was before, because it has to be. So I, I, I can see this just being a bit of a, a constant flow of, of back, to forth, back and forth influence. Not, I'm not sure I fully agree with that. I, I, I think uh, that you know the the UK has you know inevitably lost you know much of its influence over um, regulation over EU regulation as it's coming forward. I do think there will be you know a, a certain amount, as I was saying in my sort of first remarks, because there's alignment on things like climate, um, you know, on much of the regulation, there will continue to be alignment. I guess where the issue may arise is as new regulations arise on things like digital, you know, electric vehicles, for example, uh, you may start to see, you know, a tendency towards, um, towards uh, divergence. But there, I think, you know, the, the calculation will need to be made. Is there more to be gained or more to be lost? And, you know, certainly, as I said earlier, I think from our sector, we prefer to see as close convergence rather than divergence as, as we could. But that's kind of how, how I would see it, I mean. Yeah, I think I, I, I wouldn't disagree with that, Andrew. I think, I think you're, uh, yes, I think there are going to be strategic moments where either chooses, well, mostly the UK is going to choose to diverge uh, in specific sectors for, for, for the model and the competitiveness that it wants to build, almost in opposition to what the EU is doing. Um, so I, I think you will see that, but I just, I think my, my, my more general point is there's going to be a lot of, you know, the UK is probably going to become one of the most, um, one of the biggest third country lobbying groups in the EU, which, which I think will be, you know, if you look at the impact that the US has in its own way, China perhaps, they, you know, I think yeah. there's, yeah, that's going to be an interesting dynamic to follow. Yeah, great. Brilliant. Well, we've come to the end of our session today. So thank you to all of our panellists um, for all our fascinating insights. It's been a really, really great discussion. Um, there will be a recording of this that will be emailed to um, everybody who's joined us and also will be up on our website in the next couple of days. And um, we hope to um, follow up this topic again later in the year to see how things have progressed and developed. So we do hope you can all join us then. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. Have a good day.